Good afternoon and welcome to our plenary, Pathways to Truth and Reconciliation. My name is Trish Mandewa, Councillor for the City of Coquitlam, and I serve as Vancouver Metro Area Representative on the UBCM Executive. I am also the Chair of UBCM's Indigenous Relations Committee, and I'm pleased to serve as Chair for this session. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are fortunate to be able to gather on the traditional territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam people. We are grateful to have the opportunity to hold this session here today. Following the recent discoveries of mass burial sites, we are reminded once again as to the lasting legacy and deep impact of residential schools, and also to how much work remains to address this legacy. The purpose of our session today is to address the urgent question of how indigenous and non-indigenous communities might walk further along the path towards truth and reconciliation, and to provide guidance for, for local governments seeking direction on how to act on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action. In addition, at the conclusion of this session, we will formally renew our MOU with the province on engagement on First Nations and negotiations and other indigenous initiatives. I am pleased to welcome a panel of distinguished speakers today. Joining us are the Honorable Marie Sinclair, Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation, Marie Rankin, Ms. Andrea Reimer, and Chair John Jack. After all the panelists present, we will open the floor to you for Q&A. Please hold your questions until then. Our first speaker today is the Honorable Murray Sinclair. His honor served as co-chair of the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry of Manitoba and as chief commissioner of Canada's Indian Residential Schools Truth and Reconciliation Commission. As head of the Truth and Reconciliation, he participated in hundreds of hearings across Canada, culminating in what we know today as the Truth and Reconciliation wide, Wildly <coughs> Influential Report in 2015. Welcome, Your Honor, Mary Sinclair. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to be part of this uh, presentation. I probably should put the microphone in the right place. <laughs> I drive technicians crazy because I assume that everybody will fix all of my errors. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, also acknowledge the, um, the uh, elders and survivors who may be in the room and may be participating in this event. I want to um, acknowledge all of you for the work that you're doing in your various communities and for the leadership that you're showing and for the fact that you've uh, gathered in this place at this time in order to talk about a very important topic, uh, and that is the future of Indigenous and non-Indigenous relations in this country. Uh, I'm particularly uh, grateful to be on a panel with uh, the Honorable Murray Rankin. Uh, we've been on panels before together, and uh, with uh, Andrea, as we work together uh, with the uh, DC national event uh, back in the time when the TRC was holding its hearings in, uh, in British Columbia and Vancouver in particular. So thank you, it's good to see you. Uh, good to see all of you. Uh, let me uh, <clears throat> begin by uh, just talking a bit about the impact that I think that the, the uh, report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has had and um, what I see as a pathway forward for the report, particularly as it involves uh, uh, cities, towns, municipalities, and uh, local government districts uh, across the country. Uh, I know that um, 
there are many activities that are going on around the country and I don't want to discourage any of them from occurring and I encourage you all to keep doing what it is that you can do. Um, but uh, there may be some ideas that I'll be able to generate from my comments that will assist you in improving on the activities that you're now currently engaged in. Uh, I, I'm not intending on going through the history of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission or even in the processes in which we engaged or read to you the 94 calls to action uh, and uh, specifically those that relate to uh, local jurisdictions uh, because my assumption is that that would have already been discussed with you, you would have already been familiarized with them. Uh, and uh, now the real question is, how do we implement that? How do we do something about that? And, and that's a very valid question. It's probably the most common question that I get as part of the presentations that I do across the country. And that is, what can I do? What can we do? And uh, I'll see what I can do to, to help contribute to that. Uh, we need to keep in mind, though, a very important factor, and that is that the, the real significant issue that we are facing today is the impact of the residential school era, and not just the school experience, but the era uh, in which those schools were allowed to flourish upon all of us in Canada. And uh, what I've pointed out to people is that uh, while Indigenous children were being taken away from their families and placed into residential schools, uh, many were also sent to public schools in which the very same kind of messaging was being given to them, which is that as Indigenous people, they came from an inferior culture. They came from uh, a culture or community of heathens, pagans, uh, people who were backward, people who were lucky that the Europeans came here and saved them from extinction. That idea of Indigenous people being saved by Europeans was a common refrain back in the time when I went to school in the 50s and 60s, because uh, it um, was used to justify a lot of things that um, were being done by governments, both in Canada and the United States, uh, around the issue of um, removal from lands, uh, the removal of governmental authorities, the uh, redesignation of territories into provincial um, uh, and in some cases municipal districts uh, so without there being adequate consultation or cooperation uh, or compensation. And so uh, during the period following the Second World War, we begin to see in fact a, an almost forced relocation of Indigenous people into municipal areas. Uh, today, uh, First Nations people, um, about 62% of the First Nations population in Canada <coughs> um, reside in urban areas. And that uh, surprises a lot of people. They know that there's a large Indigenous population in some areas. Um, some cities and some towns uh, have more significant populations than do uh, First Nations communities. But to hear that um, number and to realize that many, if not most of those people who, are, who have urbanized over the years, uh, moved into cities and territories because the government refused to provide them with any assistance to stay in their home communities, including um, uh, internal assistance to maintain roads, to maintain housing, to uh, maintain uh, social network systems and social assistance programs and, ed and education systems. Uh, the construction of public schools or schools for First Nations communities did not really begin in earnest until after 1972 with the um, Indian education policy that the government announced at that time. And so what we see in fact is an undermining of Indigenous communities and a um, resulting uh, impoverishment of Indigenous people, because we also had, of course, the concomitant uh, reduction in their ability to utilize local resources 
um, recognizing that indigenous people for the longest time were not allowed to leave their communities without written passes from the government of Canada uh, and were prevented uh, despite their treaty rights or their indigenous rights, their aboriginal rights, prevented from harvesting their own resources in their own territories, including animal resources, access to share of uh, local resources that were taken from unsurrendered lands or unceded lands was denied to them, uh, such that uh, uh, economists now generalize that the value of resources taken away from land that formerly belonged to Indigenous people numbers in the trillions of dollars, and therefore uh, their sense of injustice and improper treatment by the government and by societies is uh, not only significant but justified. Um, all of which is to say that the forced urbanization of Indigenous people into urban areas was not of their choosing. Um, some did want to relocate because they couldn't get educational services in their home communities. In fact, many First Nations communities, if not most of them, do not have access to high school education uh, even today and have to send their children into urban areas in order to get uh, access to um, a high school degree. And uh, those who did rely upon any high school education that might have existed in their home communities often found that their high school education was deficient and was not sufficient to allow them to get into universities. So their treatment at the hands of government and by society at large, because urban areas and society at large um, outside of their home communities, their home reserves, uh, was dominated largely by a very significant racist view of indigenous people. And it's because that same messaging that I told you indigenous children received in the public schools was also received by non-indigenous children in public schools. Um, and they, non-indigenous children were taught that indigenous people were inferior, were heathens, were savages, were pagans, were violent people, were uh, out of control people, that they were on the borders of extinction, that Europeans saved them and that uh, European civilizations were far more advanced and far more equitable and far more able to properly take care of them than they were themselves, and that they would have disappeared, uh, despite the fact that they had been here for tens of thousands of years, even before the Europeans came, and uh, were able to get along quite well without European civilizations. Um, so that uh, dichotomy, that different uh, uh, reaction or learning experience in the very same public schools by indigenous and non-indigenous children has permeated our relationship quite significantly. And the result is that uh, we um, see that um, a large part of the non-indigenous population still harbors some view about indigenous people which almost blames them for their own fate and blames them, in fact, when they point out, uh, or when Indigenous people point out that they have not been duly compensated for what has been taken from them. And so uh, I, I would say that that reaction in urban areas uh, has made the urban experience by Indigenous people a largely negative one for the most part, um, notwithstanding some successes. And my family moved into uh, urban areas just before I was born. Um, and obviously I succeeded in the schools and the universities that I attended, but I was more the exception. I started school with about 45 fellow indigenous students and I was the only one to graduate from high school. And I'm the only one of that group that ever obtained a university degree. Uh, and yet probably half of them were easily as smart or smarter than I was. Uh, but they just had their hopes taken away from them and their ability to access um, 
educational programs post-secondarily uh, was also much more limited. I was only lucky to get to school at, in university because my marks allowed me to get scholarships and bursaries. And my grandmother, I don't know how she did it, despite our poverty, was able to save up enough money to get me through the first two years. So we have um, a situation now where we still have that dichotomy within urban areas. And we've got to figure out how to address that. And some communities and some groups of people say, the way we do it is to help indigenous people urbanize even more, uh, help them become like us even more. But that's not the answer. The answer is in fact, uh, helping indigenous people find their place in this society, finding uh, their sense of identity, their sense of validation, again, that they had for such a long time. And now they need to recover it. And so in urban areas, whenever I'm asked, I say that um, urban leaders should be talking about um, what you should be saying to the non-Indigenous urban population. You should be leading the non-Indigenous urban population uh, towards a process of reconciliation. You should not be concentrating so much upon uh, trying to do something with the urban Indigenous population uh, because that's not where the problem lies. The problem lies in the urban non-Indigenous population as opposed to the urban Indigenous population, they will be able to thrive with the support and assistance that they're able to receive from their home communities and with their own leadership. But um, we need to think about what is it that we can do to change the thinking of the urban non-Indigenous population. And that's a challenge. That's a real challenge because uh, we'll encounter racism there uh, at a very significant level. And racism, not necessarily in terms of uh, actual violent thinking, but racism in terms of um, an ingrained view that there's uh, something wrong with Indigenous people. And we need to recognize that we, we have a lot of work to do in that area. Uh, I said many times over the years that the key to reconciliation is the education system, changing the way that we educate our children so that we teach them how to speak to and about each other in a more respectful way. And I still believe that. Uh, so we need to recognize that at the current level with adults, even though many of them are ingrained in their thinking, we also need to demonstrate to them that if we can do that as leaders, then that will change the way that the population itself will perceive its responsibility as well. Uh, and there are other things, of course, that urban communities can be doing in terms of recognizing the, the presence that they have in urban territories, but uh, I'll leave those issues for further discussion. So. You know, I've probably gone over the few minutes that you allocated for me, but uh, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you for reminding us and for sharing from your heart. Next up, we are pleased to have the Honorable Mary Rankin, Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Welcome, Minister Rankin. Thanks very much, Councilman Mandela. It's really nice to see you again. Thank you for all your work on Indigenous reconciliation with the UUCM. Um, it's really an honor to be here in Lekwungen speaking territories in Victoria, the territory of the Songhees and the Squamalt nations. And I, I want to just say at the outset what an honor it is to be on a panel like this. Murray Sinclair has been a hero of mine ever since I met him on the streets of Ottawa when I was an MP. And of course, I followed his career very carefully. It's a remarkable career. Uh, it's great to see Andrea, Andrea again, and to John, uh, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to uh, our discussion together. 
The theme this year is obstacles and opportunities. And I suspect because we heard obstacles and opportunities elsewhere that this uh, is that could be the theme for any government. It's about looking for opportunities to better the lives of our constituents and our communities. That's what all of you are trying to do as, as councillors and directors of regional districts and the like. So finding ways to overcome obstacles that may get in the way of those goals is what it's all about. And I say, as a the theme of my remarks, the way to do that is to work together, or in the theme of this conference, to walk together. This is called Pathways to Truth and Reconciliation, and we have to walk this path together if we're going to advance reconciliation in our communities. If we're going to move forward to benefit everyone who lives in BC, Indigenous and non-Indigenous alike. Addressing, as, as Senator St. Clair said, the issue of residential schools is central to that goal and acknowledging the wrongs of the past, finally understanding our true history and working together to advance Indigenous rights has got to be a key part of that journey. Our province is focused on addressing the lasting and dark legacy of residential schools. Everyone knows the findings that the former residential school uh, sites was, were no surprise to Indigenous peoples. They were well documented by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The pathbreaking work of Senator Sinclair speaks for itself. But I have to say for many Canadians, the findings in our communities in Kamloops and Cranbrook and the Penelicate Island have been a reawakening to a more un fuller understanding of our Canadian history a more complete understanding of the legacy of our colonial past. So for survivors, intergenerational survivors and their families, these, fam these findings have been just a very poignant reminder of their own experiences. A stark reminder that this isn't about just the past, it's about the present. The residential school system has left a harmful legacy that Indigenous communities continue to live with to this day. So I want to say on behalf of our government that I commend the courage and determination of the communities that are doing the difficult work of honoring those children who never came home. Our government is working alongside the federal government to support and stand beside First Nations who are leading the strategies to find answers that so many survivors and their families have been asking for so very long. What British Columbia has done is made funding available to work at every single residential school and Indian hospital site in our province. I hasten to say that that funding supplements the support that the federal government has, has brought to the table. The federal government must stand up and take full responsibility for Senator Sinclair's calls to action on residential schools. They're all there for everyone to see in the TRC report. In July, this past July, the province appointed two First Nation liaisons, Charlene Bellow of Alkali Lake and uh, former uh, uh, Chief Counselor uh, of the Cowichan, Lydia Whitson. They are providing enormous support to First Nations, those so-called caretaker communities, and putting survivors, intergenerational survivors and communities at the center of our work. So I say our role as governments, local and provincial is to support nations in their work. And I would invite local governments to do, uh, take a position uh, accordingly on this work. Now working with local governments is critical. All levels of government have a role in advancing reconciliation with indigenous peoples. In writing the wrongs of the past and moving forward together in a better way. So I come back again and again to this idea of walking uh, together. To create relationships is the most important thing we can do. And nowhere are relationships with Indigenous peoples more important than at the local level. Because we have huge opportunities to advance reconciliation through local governments and First Nations working together. I'm going to give some examples. But if we can form and strengthen relationships, if we can learn from each other about our respective systems of governance, our decision-making processes, if we can collaborate on matters of mutual interest, that's where we're gonna make a difference. You know, over the last little while, as I learned about speed dating at UBCM, I've spoken to over 20 of, uh, of representatives of local government, and I've learned a lot 
about some of the amazing things that are going on in your communities. And there's so much more we can do, but I congratulate you. So much change has occurred. There's programs like Community to Community Forum that supports these relationships. There's funding available uh, for events to bring local governments and indigenous organizations together. There's the Pathways to Collaboration program, which is a series of case studies highlighting the growing number of successful economic collaborations. Just this past summer, we announced a new $30 million grant program called the 150 Time Immemorial Program to honor British Columbia's entry into Confederation. Working with the First Peoples Cultural Foundation and Heritage BC, we're funding projects that educate people about British Columbia's colonial past and that advance reconciliation and promote inclusivity and diversity for the province's future. And those programs are available, of course, to local governments. There's so much significant work going on at the local level to build relationships. And I honestly see a strong commitment to working together like never before is emerging across our province. Some examples. Earlier this year, a memorandum of understanding was signed between the District of Ladsville and the Stanawas Nation that helped strengthen government to government relationships, further dialogue and promote collaboration in the best interests of both communities. New Westminster and the Chilcotin Nation recently became sister communities committing to work together to enrich the lives of both communities. In April, under the Maynooth Treaty here on Vancouver Island, the Cayuca Chekelset First Nations joined the Strathcona Regional District, which of course is another way, very direct way of strengthening government to government relationships. My fellow panelist, Councillor John Jack of the Huayat First Nation is also the elected chair of the Alberni Clapwood Regional District. I wanna give you another example. I, in June, I had this opportunity to go over to the city of Mission, COVID allowed it. And I went to and saw the value of partnerships really in a deep and profound way. Because there I was involved in signing a re reconciliation agreement with the city of Mission, the Lacomel, the Matsui and the Sumas First Nations. Under that agreement, the province returned traditional lands to First Nations. And what that did is it created a protected park and recreation area for everyone in the community. And the city will manage that, that land, but also land was provided to support housing opportunities for the nations, economic development for those First Nations. I think it's pretty, I think it is unique for a local municipality to be a full signatory of a reconciliation agreement like that. And I hope we see many more such partnerships across the province. They just make sense and, and they're so exciting uh, to observe. And I think they it only happened because everyone came together. I love the name of the agreement, Together We Paddle, which I think says it all. In this spirit, our government has been focusing much more strongly on engaging local governments more meaningfully as we negotiate agreements and other initiatives with First Nations. So obviously I'm committed to involving uh, for, uh, our municipal governments and regional districts in that work, because if we don't get it right in these agreements that the federal provincial governments are entering into with indigenous partners, it's not gonna work in the community. So we need uh, and want your, uh, your participation. And we're committed, and we'll talk about that later with our uh, agreement to be renewed today, to be more transparent and work with you wherever possible because it's only gonna work if we can do it together. Now, I just wanna conclude by saying there's something that you will, that obviously is central to our government's work, and that's the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act that became law in late 2019. I stress that it's not a government, this particular government initiative, it's all of British Columbia's representatives stood up in the legislature to support that, all parties. And it made, under the uh, framework for reconciliation, which was a key part of the calls to action from the TRC report. I wanna acknowledge that local governments were key partners in that initiative. They were there, they were supportive, and I have to say it made an enormous difference. And I, I really appreciate all of that 
that support across the province. It's the first bill of its kind ever in Canada, and now we have a federal one, uh, which I think will make a difference across the country. So we've been engaging people in developing a draft action plan with some specific measures perhaps we can talk about together uh, uh, in, in, in the question and answer period. But again, UBCM was there and helped us, and I really appreciate the idea. I'm really grateful for you for, for that. And we're gonna have uh, the action plan was released in draft form and pretty soon we're gonna finalize it, hopefully get it out by the end of the year or soon thereafter. So it's all about partnerships, like I said, partnerships between local government, provincial government and uh, indigenous peoples. So I just want to say, it's been a real honor to be with you again today at UBCM. Thank you for all of the work that you're doing in your communities to make a difference. Thank you very much, Councillor. Thank you, Minister Rankin. And it's also a pleasure to see you abate virtually. Hopefully next year we'll be able to be in the same room. And I also wanted to thank you for, for continuing on the message that his owner started taking us back on the injustices and on the impact that it had on both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. And you continue to talk about the fact that it's not only about the past, but it's about the now, and what is it that we can do, and what calls to action we have. On that note, I would like to welcome Ms. Andrea Reimer. In her tenure at Vancouver City Council, Ms. Reimer led Vancouver's municipal framework for reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. She is now an adjunct professor of practice at UBC's School of Public Policy and Global Affairs and founder and principal of Tao Wow Strategies. Welcome, Ms. Andrea Reimer. Thank you so much, Councillor Mandewo. Great pronunciation of Tao Wow. Um, for those that might be wondering, it's a, a Cree word, Nahia Wewen word, that means um, welcome. There's room. You're welcome into the space. Um, so what a pleasure to join you all. I'd say to see you all, but of course we can't see you. Um, but to all my former colleagues at the UBCM and, and all of you that have stepped up into local government um, since I left office in 2018, it is, it's such an honor to spend some time with you and to say, um, just recognize and honor how difficult your jobs have been this last two years. I know they're hard all the time, um, but I don't think um, any level of government has to catch more balls in an emergency than local government. So to acknowledge that. And um, Chair Jack, we haven't met before um, this panel, but I would acknowledge your work in that regard as well. Minister Rankin, um, always a pleasure to hear you talk, but to thank you um, as personally as we can get in these circumstances for the work your government's been doing on the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. Um, and also um, his honor, Mira Sinclair, um, I really always, it's such an incredible thing to spend time with you in any venue, but to hear your words today um, really reinforced to me how grateful I am for your leadership, how lucky we've been as a country for your leadership and others who've stood alongside you um, to push these issues forward. So um, normally I would situate myself a bit um, personally in a discussion like this, but for reasons that I think will become clear, we're not going to do that other than to say, as you heard, um, and some of you know, I was an elected councillor in the city of Vancouver from 2008 to 2018. Um, in that position, um, Vancouver and myself as the lead on it took a real leadership position on issues of reconciliation, although I will situate that by saying that it, it was a leadership position in the colonial context. We were one of the first, in fact, the first government to really push on it at the municipal level. Um, but it was very late if you're an indigenous person, right? Like, like 2013, 2012, which were the first years that we sort of got going on it um, are about 150 years past when we should have been working hard on these issues. So we started by, um, well, okay, and I'm gonna to get to this, but there's no real start. I mean, many of you have been working on these issues for a long time, whether you recognize it or not, um, and it's gonna be a long time still that you'll be working on them. But our, our sort of modern era of work that Vancouver was recognized for started with um, the declaration of the Year of Reconciliation in the year 2013. And that was on the occasion, um, as His Honor Mary Sinclair noted, of the uh, BC national event of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission coming. So we wanted to make 
uh, the space, essentially, a grand gesture that was very clear that we were making the space for this work of reconciliation. Um, there were literally hundreds of events that um, happened over the course of that year that I'm not going to list off for you, um, but I think probably some of the more significant ones were the canoe welcome, the first time that had happened since um, Europeans came to this territory, this territory um, where I am, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, traditional homelands, um, the Walk for Reconciliation, where we had over 70,000 people, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, out on the streets, and then the hearings themselves um, that the TRC held in Vancouver. It all culminated at the end of the year with us declaring um, that we were on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil an action that um, to me was just a simple declaration of fact and a way of acknowledging what we'd heard during the year, but um, sparked a lot of um, discussion across the country. I got hundreds of letters that you're probably thinking in your head, yes, very angry ones of people who had fear and prejudice, but no, I got one like that. Um, I got hundreds of letters from councillors and regional district representatives and Reeves and people from all across the country saying, I want to do this. How, how do I do this? And I was like, well, uh, you know, my gut just told me that's not where you start. And it, it started me on a long process of really understanding um, that this is a, it is a process and that you can do a lot of damage to your work on reconciliation by making it performative, by seeing someone rename a street or take down a statue and be like, that's what we're going to do as your first step into it without some broader analysis of your own situation and how you are going to act within that situation. So I wanted to offer to you today three things that I think I learned in my time working on this um, in hopes that it helped inform you and helps speed up what's happening. Because I'm guessing the bigger problem for you isn't like uh, the action part, it's the inaction part. And this question of like, how do we get started, right? So I, I've tried to lay it out in a chronological order for you. So the first thing I would say um, is learn. Um, so simple, right? You need to learn. Um, but the thing I would say is that learning starts with unlearning. So there is a, um, I couldn't have asked His Honor Murray Sinclair to set it up better for me um, because they, there's all this stuff in our heads that takes up a lot of space. So when you say indigenous, um, all these ideas attached to that immediately, the idea that this was a sparsely populated continent um, that had unsophisticated savage people living in it um, that in many ways in that context, we have this idea that they would have been grateful for the arrival of Europeans um, to just help them out with things that they weren't very good at. When reality, um, the population of the Americas was roughly the same as the population of Western Europe when Europeans showed up here. So this was not an unpopulated place. There were large civilizations, there was fantastic urban planning, there was excellent architecture, there was science, there was religion. And I think very significantly, there were trade routes that went from the tip of Alaska down to the bottom of Argentina and Patagonia. So this idea that when we're participating in economic reconciliation in non-Indigenous communities, that we're somehow helping out Indigenous communities with something they weren't good at or couldn't do is a completely false notion. We broke Indigenous communities through colonization. We broke well-functioning economies um, that were continental in scope. And that is why we are in the situation we are now, not because there was a lack of capacity here to be able to perform these functions that we're now trying to figure out how to unbreak. So that would be my first thing is that, um, Learning is as much about unlearning as it is about adding new information in, and that's where we need to start. Um, the second thing is that how you learn is very important. So the way this has been going a bit over the last decade or so, and I think very much so for the decades before that, is that when non-Indigenous people want to learn about Indigenous people, they ask their Indigenous friend um, to help them out with this, right? Um, which is, I don't want to diminish, it's better than not asking anyone, uh, but if you go to that unlearning piece, there are many places you can go to unlearn what you've learned about Indigenous people and learned about false impressions you've had about your own culture, um, and those don't need to be Indigenous people. So I would say the unlearning is on you. Go read the TRC report. It's very well enumerated in there, the history of what happened on this continent and the impacts of what it it had on Indigenous people. Um, and then when you do need to learn in real time, to really set yourself a test. Is this extractive? And am I trying to do it in a way that's risk-free? So extractive, what that looks like is, well, we invited them. 
So we hosted the meeting in a place we feel really comfortable in. We made decisions about the agenda. We made decisions about what was gonna happen in that space. And we invited them here, but we're asking them to take all the risk. Um, and we're also asking for their time for free, right? So, and these are communities that are much smaller generally than the, the larger municipalities that we're talking about. Um, and we need to think about when we're asking them for their emotional label, for their um, what, what they're not doing when they're coming to meetings that we're hosting. Um, and why we're not prepared to go walk across whatever space we need to go walk across to be able to engage with um, Indigenous communities on their own terms. So I would say um, the unlearning you can do on your own time, the learning you really need to set that test of am I extracting and am I trying to do this in a way that is risk-free because there is no risk-free way forward. The third thing I would say and last is that this is a relationship-based process. I would say uh, every Indigenous community I have worked with, which include the three within Vancouver, but now I, I work with many more Indigenous communities outside Vancouver, outside British Columbia. Uh, when, I, when I say, well, you know, we can do this like protocol agreement or whatever, but it's going to take time. Uh, every time what I get back from the chief or the elders is, Andrea, we've been waiting a long time. <laughs> like we can wait another year or two years or three years to get this done, right? And at the same time, there are truly urgent issues that can't wait. And these are issues of access to healthcare. These are issues of safety and survival for Indigenous women and girls. So it's about parsing that out. What do you legitimately need to speed up because they're urgent issues versus what needs to take the time that relationship takes to build. Um, the last thing I'll end off on is that, gee, Andrea, that sounds hard. Yes, it's super hard. It is, there's no question, there's nothing about this that isn't hard, but uh, on the other side of that scale, um, there's nothing about not acting that isn't also super hard. Um, and that carries a very, a very clear cost to individuals, indigenous individuals for sure, as we've seen and what's prompted the calls for justice, the calls for action, um, and many of the pieces of legislation we've seen coming forward and government actions, but also to non-indigenous peoples, like a lot has been lost by a lack of being able to collaborate together. I mean, knowing that um, John Jack is chair of the regional district, that collaboration is way bigger than the sum of its parts. And so we can't just think of this as helping people. We need to think of it as the collective action we take together is the only way we're going to get past the issues that we have of climate change, pandemics, um, social um, inequity. I mean, there's so many issues that benefit so much greater by all of us being involved and being involved at a level of respect and mutuality that these relationships demand. And so the last thing, very last thing I'll leave you with, um, because I told you I would situate myself at some point during this. Um, when I embarked on all this work, uh, I was coming at it from the perspective of uh, a person who'd grown up low income. I was fostered and adopted. I didn't have any um, connection to my own personal history since found out that I am Indigenous, so I, I sort of, I feel like um, my birth family is Indigenous, so I didn't grow up in an Indigenous community, which is a, a very important distinction of situation. Uh, but to say that I feel like somehow this process, it, I've had to unlearn a lot of things too about me. I've had to learn a lot of things um, about and, and how that's going to move forward. And I've also had to realize how important these relationship-based processes are, because ultimately the, the biggest act of reconciliation any of us will have is with ourselves, regardless of how our personal stories in, intersect with Indigenous and non-Indigenous. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Raima. What, what wise words you left us with. Make the space for reconciliation. Seek to understand and not be performative. Learn, but it all starts by unlearning. We truly appreciate your sharing. Next up, we have our final panelist today uh, from Albany, Clayoquot Regional District, Chair John Jack. Chair Jack is an elected member of council for the Who I At First Nations and has focused much of his efforts on creating the mutual understanding between local governments and Aboriginal communities. Welcome, Chair Jack. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start off by thanking everyone for coming and to acknowledge that um, His Honor and the Minister and Ms. Reimer for 
what they've said already. It's been very good to kind of round everything out. I'm finding that I was scribbling a bunch of notes, given that a lot of things have already been covered off. But what I am going to say, I think is going to be a bit dense, because I would really like to get to questions and answers and, and letting the panel talk a bit more. So we've already talked about the theme of our, uh, our convention here today, as well as the, the title of this particular section, which are Pathways to Reconciliation. Uh, at Huwait, we think of reconciliation in multiple ways. We think of reconciliation as being something that is both legal and political in one category, things like treaties and agreements and that sort of thing, and social and educational, which are things that overlap with the rest of society, but also touches on the types of things that we teach ourselves, the things we unlearn and learn, and economic or business-based reconciliation, which coupled with political is something that I tend to focus on a lot in my work as a member of council for Hawaii. Now, it has been said already that relationships are central to the entire endeavor of reconciliation. And that is completely true, that the relationships that we build in many ways are the things that are going to take us further on into reconciliation in a working way. What matters is exactly what has been said before, uh, a question of inaction and action. How do we shift from talking about it and learning about it and demonstrating that we've learned about it over and over again into what are the things that we can actually do to show and move forward reconciliation? So it's not so much talking about these things anymore, but actually embarking upon them. And those relationships are what matter. So. You can think of those relationships between governments, between communities as having many aspects, and I'm going to rifle through them right now, so hopefully we're okay. We have formal relationships. These are relationships that are usually done through a treaty, like I have with my First Nation, uh, with other First Nations and the Crown governments. We also have professional relationships between organizations, either through our own staff or through our councils. Then we have our informal or social relationships, which are like a wild card that go through these things. These relationships take place in different places, physically, um, but also mentally. And it, it really helps to think about them in these ways. Many of the relationships get stuck on the stage. So it's been alluded to that we talk about performative reconciliation and that that does exist and it is a bit of an issue here and there because it does seem to stall us in the real work that has to go on. There is a place for it though. And in many First Nations communities, governance is conducted by the light of the big house fire and that their constituents, their people expect to see those discussions happen in front of them because that's how it was done before in oral cultures. There were no contracts, there was no written word so in order to remember an agreement between two tribes, whether it be trade or mutual protection or what have you, it has to live in here, which means that our cultural expectations are things where we need to see them. But we often get caught up in the modern stage rather than what existed on the big house floor. And we have to think about it in those terms. So there is a place for the stage. There is a place for theatrics and showing but there's the boardroom relationship. When you sit down and you actually hammer out what the terms of your agreement will be and how we're going to hammer out accountability measures and how we're going to disagree and resolve our disputes if and, and when they come up. And then lastly, and I think this is something that's quite relevant, are the working groups. These are the more informal groups where we have to sit down in a technical level or just a frank level, depending on who's doing the work, and hammer out just what it looks like, just what those processes look like. This is the really, really boring stuff that needs to happen because they form the foundation of what accountability looks like moving into the future. So I'm getting ahead of myself a bit though. What really seems to matter in regards to moving forward with First Nations leaders and First Nations communities is building trust. And patience is definitely a part of that. And not trying to tick off boxes is first and foremost. This is something that many First Nations communities have to uh, talk to uh, members of government about or their, their leaders. I'm pretty sure Minister Rankin has heard 
this isn't a checkbox exercise. We need to go through and have a real relationship and frank discussion about it. He was a negotiator for the crown and he was quite good at it. So he understands. But in order to build that trust, however, you need to be consistent in your stated intent and your follow-up actions. And the best way to do that formally at the very least and professionally is to set out expectations ahead of time. And the only way you're going to do that is by moving through and understanding things from the perspective of First Nations. And while I'd like to go into detail about that, I don't have a lot of time left, so I'm just gonna go on and move toward my, my, my conclusion. First Nations today, many of them are in a process of becoming. We are becoming. We're becoming what? We're all trying to become what we should have been if things were better, if things had happened in the way that they should have rather than the things that they had. And how that looks for each First Nation and community is markedly different. The decisions being made by the Nishka First Nation or Monoth or Swanson or Plotman are markedly different than the routes that other First Nations will be taking, more say the Chilcotin route. Those are all valid routes to the same place, a place where First Nations can come together as a community to pursue their goals as they see fit. And in order to pursue those goals and achieve them, they have to have power. And this is where the types of reconciliation matter. Political and legal reconciliation matters because those set out the tools by which governments have to pursue their goals. Social and education reconciliation set out the kind of potential for First Nation communities to actually achieve those goals throughout the entirety of the wider society, the community of communities of BC and Canada. Economic and business reconciliation provide the resources for those First Nations to actually achieve those goals in real terms. Each of these things talk about power and each of these things will have an impact on the actors within those, those different theaters, all those different landscapes. And in many instances, which has happened in the Albany Climate Regional District, it has an actual real traceable impact on the decision-making processes and the power that a board may have or the processes by which the members of those boards may have. Adding four voting members to our board has changed the complete conversation. And that means that we will always be conducting our business differently from here on in because the votes are different now. You can't just have one or two constituents carrying the day forever. It has to be a wider conversation. Those changes will be disruptive and they'll be scary, especially to some of your constituents and maybe even to you. And what I need to reiterate is that's kind of the point. The, you need to make space. We say this, but we think it's just, oh, we need to make space or time for someone to come in and say something. No, they have to have space to actually make decisions that will affect you in some way, shape, or form. And that has to be okay. You have to understand what that's going to look like, even if, especially if you don't agree with the decisions that are being put forward. First Nations are becoming the societies that they want to be. And that may mean that they're their chosen path, their goals might be different than what you would have chosen had you been in that position. They may be different than what you think First Nations are supposed to be doing. And in that, I will say that sovereignty is the, is the pursuit of goals as a First Nation or as a community defines for itself. Now, there is backplay, there is inter interconnectivity, and there is conversations. But if I can leave anyone with anything, it's it's respecting the fact that First Nations largely know what they need to do to make the lives of their peoples better. And you can be there to help make things smoother or more clear along the way. But when a First Nation decides to pursue economic reconciliation by growing the economic pie rather than fighting over a smaller and smaller piece of the government largesse, you have to get out of their way. You have to trust them to manage their resources, even if you don't think it's the right way to do it. I think I'm gonna leave off with that. But what I do think is that respecting indigenous leadership and processes is what's going to matter here. That there are parts of discussions that will be conducted internally to those nations alone. And when those things are decided, those need to be respected, even if you don't agree with them. And then when you sit down and try to hammer out a relationship, 
make sure that you can accept some of the accountability measures that will be placed because only by abiding by those accountability measures will you actually build trust to a point where First Nations will take a risk themselves in proposing things. And I think that's really going to be the point moving forward in all of the things that are happening in the economy and politics today. First Nations working with the communities around them is going to be key for economic and political reasons and legal ones as well. But this is how we're going to create opportunities for moving into the future in a way that should be, not just what is. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Jack. And thank you for your honesty. You reminded us that we need to start from a place of building relationships. And that's a message that we have had from several of the speakers, that it starts with those relationships. Be it uh, formal relationships, professional relationships, we need to start. You also reminded us of the cultural expectations. We truly thank you for the message. We will now take questions from delegates. At the top of your session, on the screen, you will see two tabs. One of them is trim and the other one is engage. The engage tab is where you can submit questions for our panelists. Once you have submitted your question in the engage tab, you will need to click back to the stream, to the stream tab so you can continue to view the workshop. Please sign your question with your full name, elected position, and local government or First Nations. As a reminder to delegates, as per the conference rules and procedures, only elected officials have the privilege to the floor. So we will now go to the questions. At this time, we are just waiting for the questions to come in. There is a delay between the production that's happening here and those that are watching virtually. So we are patiently waiting for the questions to come in.
So we have our first question. The question is, how do we build capacity to work with our First Nations partners? Perhaps I can have, I can start with uh, his honor, and then we can move on to um, Minister, Minister Rankin to answer that question. Yeah, one of the <clears throat> one of the privileges of going first is I get to field the question first, I guess. But um, building capacity, uh, I really look forward to seeing what uh, John and Andrea say about that because they've got experience doing it. But uh, when I've been asked this question before, my answer has always been uh, similar to the to some of the information that they've already shared with you, and. Um, um, particularly Andrew's remarks about uh, learning and unlearning. Probably one of the most important things is to ensure that those who are uh, leading the dialogue and those who are participating in the process of reconciliation at uh, municipal or city or uh, governmental levels, including the federal government, uh, have a good understanding of what uh, this is all about. and. Uh, it's really, it's quite surprising to me still uh, to find out how many federal government civil servants who are working within the reconciliation initiative that the federal government sets for itself have never read the TRC report and don't even know what the uh, calls to action are about or why they're there. Uh, and that's part of the problem is that if you don't know um, what it is that this is all about. If you're just kind of going by the news media coverage of the TRC process, that's not enough. That's, uh, that's helpful, but it's not enough. You really do need to ensure that there is a proper, uh, almost like a career development uh, initiative that's put in place for all of your employees and for yourselves as well as leaders to ensure that you understand uh, what it is that you can do and, and how you can be doing it. Um, and so I would encourage as a first step to take a look at the uh, whatever document you want to rely upon, uh, but to take a look at the question of um, what is it that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has said about a particular initiative or particular subject or a particular area, uh, and that will help. That will guide you to um, looking at how you can uh, build capacity within your own organization. The kind of skill set that you need to put in place at various levels, sometimes at the upper level, sometimes in the mid level, and uh, the kinds of things that you're going to expect from. Um, your employees. Probably the second thing, if not the first thing, but the, either way, they're both very important, is you need a plan. You need to put together a plan, a plan for reconciliation. Um, I, I was asked to attend a number of meetings with the prime minister and his advisory team on reconciliation. And the first question, of course, they asked me is, how do you think we're doing? And I said, I think you're doing pretty poorly because you don't have a plan yet. I, I don't know what your plan for reconciliation is. I don't know where you want to be in five years, 10 years, 25 years from now. Uh, I don't know what your plan is for your employees. I don't know what your plan is for the citizens. I don't know what your plan is for uh, dedicating resources to particular areas. And um, that's important is to have a plan and also understand where it is that you can actually be doing things without necessarily um, having to rely upon the indigenous community to tell you what to do. Um, but there are certain things that you can do um, already. So, uh, so I think just looking at it from that, from those perspectives, and there may be other ideas as well that others can, can respond to. Thank you, Your Honor. I think, uh, Minister Rankin, you could uh, briefly chime in. 
Thank you. And I can build nicely on what Senator Sinclair said, I think, um, in his Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission report calls to action 62 to 65 deal with uh, education on, on reconciliation. And I know in other speeches and in today's remarks, uh, Senator Sinclair has very powerfully talked about the need to educate. I would say uh, the key thing for municipalities is to learn from each other. On one of the calls I had uh, with municipalities uh, this last week, I, I, I talked about calling each other. I gave one, you know, one uh, mayor's uh, na name and number to another because there was the work that had been done in their community that I thought could be of great help. And I really like how the UBCM has got a number of resources that they put together. They've served as a clearinghouse. And I'm thinking of civic information as another area. I'm thinking of the uh, community to community forum, the pathways to collaboration. These are places where we have a compendium of success stories. What works, what doesn't work. Now to go back to the specifics, um, I think that uh, John Jack really described really well the nature of, and the importance of relationships. But I talk a lot about informal relationships. I, I talk a lot of, one chief told me the most important thing that local government can do is to pick up the phone, as he put it. Call and start a dialogue, call and get to know your neighbors, try to find out things where you can successfully collaborate. And out of that came a, you know, a, a service agreement on sewage and water, for example, where you know, mutual needs were, were satisfied. Uh, so I think that relationships start often at a very personal level, and I would I would promote that. Last point I'll make is in relation to what Senator Sinclair just talked about a, as a plan. I didn't have a chance to say, uh, and I'm very proud of the work that we're doing as a government. All ministries of the, our government are committed to an action plan. There are 79 specific, tangible, achievable agree, uh, things that are in our draft action plan that will be finalized in the next short while. And I, I think that it's really important that we have specifics and we can be held accountable for that. And so every year we have, for the five years of this action plan, there'll be annual reports and people can say, you did that, you didn't do that, you could do more here. Those are things, that level of accountability, having a plan and holding yourself to account for those objectives, I think is really critical as well. So I, I would uh, urge people to take a look at the action plan that's uh, on the ministry website and see what if you think we're on the right track. Thanks, Trisha. Thank you, Minister. I think this is such an, a critical question that I think I would love to hear from all the panelists. So next we'll go to Ms. Reimer and then Chair Jack, you will follow as well. Great, uh, well, I, I would agree substantively what um, what both um, His Honor Mary Sinclair and the Minister have said. Um, I, I would also, this is just the complexity, well, it's the complexity of running a local government, but it's also the complexity of boldly going into a policy area that is, there's no manual for this, right? We, we, we broke it and we need to fix it and we need to figure out how to do that together. So I would say that literally anything you do that you're not currently doing will build capacity. So it's to say that like if you're sitting waiting to act until you've figured out the plan for building capacity, that is much worse than just doing anything, like choose literally anything. I will temper that by saying um, those anything, some of them come at a much higher cost, both um, you know, to you, time and money-wise as a municipality, but also the emotional um, and structural labor that it's putting on Indigenous communities. I would put um, statues, road naming, and flags in that category. I mean, what you will learn after many working group meetings is that um, Indigenous communities didn't really have flags, so they don't really care about having them in your council chamber. Um, statues, like honoring specific individuals wasn't a um, deeply embedded practice in most indigenous communities and roads were not a thing the way we understand them. So like don't name them after genocidal jerks, but also like if you wanna rename them, just get on with it, right? Well, what is of interest is how to build those relationships that will fundamentally change the nature of the structure of governance and um, economics. So things that fall learning um, together is a good thing. Learning alone is a good thing. I would also say like, it's gotta be mission driven. Like you're on a mission. This is not about like fixing X widgets or building X widgets by a certain date. It's about changing everything. And we have this opportunity coming up on September 30th with the 
first National Day of Truth and Reconciliation to really think about what your commitment is. Like what mission are you gonna head out on between now and the next National Day of Truth and Reconciliation? And what are you gonna get done to build capacity? Do not put it off for another year or even another half year, like just get going on it today. Thank you, thank you so much, Ms. Raima. So our Slido is now buzzing with questions, but a Chair Jack, I'm just gonna give you a brief moment to respond to this one with any new additions that you might have. So I think, I think I'll build on the idea of building capacity as something that you start to do. Um, and I think thinking about it in terms of what are the different types or categories of relationships that you can build so that your capacity can build in those multiple ways. So there's relationships between governance. So you have your board or your uh, city council, and they have relationships with government on the other side. There's the formal, there's the informal, and dealing with that is important. Reaching out personally matters a lot, um, but having those formal relationships to allow for structure, to allow for accountability matters too. What's often forgotten is that many First Nations are still stuck in a... Um, in an election cycle that's every two years or something like that, which often means that the corporate memory exists primarily in that of the, the chief or the, the high ranking administrative individuals. And therefore a relationship between your administration and their administration matters too. Even just having those relationships moving and having some internal conversations will build your capacity to be able to do some of the work to meet them more than halfway. Um, one thing that matters, not just patience, but is trying to understand things from a First Nations community's perspective. And for the most part, those communities already have documents or items that are freely available on their websites that outline the things that they're trying to do. And one thing that may be lacking is how that interfaces with what you're maybe having the capacity to help with or understand or help through in some way, shape or form. And those are the types of opportunities that can help create more opportunities for a more fulfilling relationship. Look at what First Nations are setting out to do with their own budgets, with their own strategic plans, with their own, uh, I can't remember what they call it, but it's a CCP, Comprehensive Community Plan, and so on and so forth. And how does that and how can that fit into your own capacities to move forward together? Um, I think I'll just leave it at that, though. Thank you so much, Chair. So I'm just gonna remind everybody, we have quite a number of questions and I would love to, for us to cover as much as possible. So let's give some brief questions so we can cover some ground. So Kate, uh, Councillor Kate Marsh from uh, MNC RD, CVRD. <laughs> uh, thanks for the acronyms. It's an honor to be here, she says, with you and listen to you. What can be done if trust is broken by taking more performative actions up to now? And now um, anyone can chime in on that one. Chair, Chair Jack, you can go ahead. Yeah, I think, I think it's important to note that relationships aren't broken forever and that you can mend them over time and they may become stronger like a bone over time. Therefore, it's worth trying. Um, in many ways, what you need to do in terms of mending a broken relationship is to acknowledge how it was broken and what you're planning on doing that can be tracked over time to ensure that that never happens again. And then from there, it's mostly just managing the relationship in such a way that provides opportunities for First Nations to achieve their aims, uh, not just yours, and that their aims matter more than what it is you're trying to do by embarking upon this. Most of reconciliation is an investment in a future that you may not see, but that still makes it worth it. And so there are so many things that can be done to mend fences, but it's the follow-up that matters the most because none of us are going anywhere. It's in our interest to try to work together. But first and foremost is the acknowledgement of what has occurred, the error that's occurred, what's going to rectify that and what activities are going to take, take their place in the future. And how can you create mechanisms or procedures or protocols to ensure that that moves forward in a good way. Thank you so much, Chair, Chair Jack. So many great comments came from these conversations and from the questions as well. I heard about the importance of um, having an actionable plan, seeking to understand, learning from each other, 
plus many more nuggets that we got from this. I wish we would have had a chance to go into all the questions, but I highly recommend that you reach out to any of the panelists if your questions, if we didn't get to any of your questions. So thank you all again for all the insights. Before we close today, I would like to welcome Minister Rankin, together with Minister of Municipal Affairs, Josie Osborne, as well as UBCM President, Brian Franco, to provide brief remarks as we renew our MOU with the province on engagement with the UBCM, local governments, on First Nations negotiations, and, un and other indigenous initiatives. This is a long-standing MOU most recently renewed in 2018 that supports sharing of information between the province, local governments, and UBCM on a wide ranging um, initiatives and agreements such as land, resources, economic agreements uh, between the province and the First Nations. I'd now like to invite Minister Rankin to make some remarks on the renewal of the MOU. Welcome again, Minister Rankin. Thanks very much, Councillor Mendeo. It's, uh, it's just so great uh, to be joined by my colleague, uh, Minister Josie Osborne. I think a lot of you, of course, know her. She's someone who really walks the talk on all of this. I'm thinking of her pathbreaking work with the Tolokriot in her community, Tofino and Clackwood Sound. And I really look forward to her remarks and those of UBCM President Brian Frankel that I've spoken with before on these topics. I can just say, and I've got very little time to say it, that uh, I feel a little bit like Rip Van Winkle. Some of you will remember him, you know, a guy who wakes up a generation later from a deep sleep. The, the, the sea change at UBCM and local government over the years that I've observed is really quite remarkable. And your leadership on reconciliation and trying to be a clearinghouse for local governments to do this work deserves a lot of credit. And I want to say that. And, I think that's why signing a renewal of the MOU uh, between us, between my ministry and, uh, and UBCM is so important. I'm committed to working together uh, with you to advance lasting a reconciliation that works with Indigenous peoples and makes our province a better place. Now, the MOU was last renewed in 2018 and signed off by my predecessor, uh, Scott Fraser, when he was minister. But a lot has happened, as everyone knows, in the last three years, top among them, of course, is fulfilling our government's commitment to put the principles of UNDRIP uh, into action. And we, of course, did that in 2019 by passing unanimously in the legislature the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. That was a huge step, as we talked about earlier, and supported strongly by local governments. So this renewed MOU reflects the new legislation and underscores uh, local government's key role as a valued partner in advancing reconciliation. The MOU is important because community engagement promotes stronger partnerships between First Peoples, local governments, and stakeholders. So that leads to better opportunities for everyone. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak again, and I look forward to signing the renewed MOU once our other distinguished speakers have offered their thoughts. Thanks very much, Councillor Medeo. Thank you, Minister Rankin. Next up, we are pleased to welcome Minister Osborne, who is in the room with us. Thank you so much. Good afternoon again, everyone. I think it's just so important to start off by acknowledging that I am speaking here today to you from the traditional territory of the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Musqueam peoples. And I am honored to join you today for the renewal of this Memorandum of Understanding between the province and UBCM. The renewed agreement strengthens the partnership between the province and local governments and our mutual commitment toward reconciliation with Indigenous nations. It encourages strong communication and information sharing that's needed to open doors to meaningful conversations and partnerships that will benefit communities throughout British Columbia. We're committed to finding ways to be better partners and to make life better for people in Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities. We need to foster whole communities, communities that build bridges between cultures and people, communities that respect, honour and celebrate culture and heritage. We owe it to the people impacted by injustice to do better together. And now, more than ever, is the time. 
As we keep listening and learning, we're nurturing relationships that are built on honesty and respect. These are the kind of relationships that will help us move forward, move reconciliation forward at the community level. I look forward to hearing more about the transformative conversations and the change that is already beginning to take place and more that is yet to come. I'm very pleased to support the next steps on moving this MOU forward and I commit to continuing to encourage all ministries to ensure that local governments are included in the work to advance reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. As Minister of Municipal Affairs, I'm deeply committed to working alongside and supporting local governments in advancing reconciliation with Indigenous peoples to right historical and ongoing wrongs and to move forward for the benefit of everyone who lives in BC. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join you today. Thank you so much, Minister Osborne. And finally, I would like to uh, invite our president, Brian Franco, to say a few words. Thanks, Councillor. A good afternoon. I hope you've enjoyed the session today and will take away some valuable lessons on opportunities for actions towards reconciliation. We need to walk this path together. UBCM is strongly committed to creating opportunities for dialogue and collaboration between our community leaders, representatives, and others. It is through such, such efforts that strong relationships are built. UBCM and the province have established a strong relationship in working together towards reconciliation, founded in part on initiatives such as the Community to Community Forum program. This MOU will help build our relationship by renewing a commitment to work together and engage on wide-ranging negotiations and initiatives, including the implementation of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. As we look forward to working with the province to continue to build understanding and to support reconciliation going forward, I would specifically like to thank Ministers Rankin and Ministers Osborne and their staff. The province has put a great deal of work into the process leading into the renewal of this agreement. I just want to say one thing. I'm really honoured to sign this uh, MOU on behalf of all of our membership at UBCM. So I would ask Councillor Mendeo to come up and we shall sign. Thank you, President Franco. We shall now proceed to signing the MOU. And Minister Rankin is signing virtually. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> Virtual signing. Yes. I love it. Yours. Thank you so much. Um, Minister Mitt Rankin, we are sending it to you virtually. <laughs> So this concludes our, our workshop today. I would love to thank all the speakers today for an informative and thought-provoking session. In appreciation of our speakers today, and with thanks for their contribution, UBCM has made a donation to the Indian Residential School uh, Survivors Society. The society provides essential services to residential school survivors, their families, and those dealing with intergenerational traumas. These impacts affect every family and every community across BC and Canada. Thank you for participating in this session. We hope you enjoy that. A reminder to all delegates that next in the program, we have concurrent workshops from 2.45 until 4 p.m. And for those of you attending the workshop on climate action and the pension primer, 
The workshop will begin at 2.45, but we have an informative PowerPoint available for viewing from 2.30 until 2.45. The PowerPoint will be shown in the main lobby. Please remember to unmute the video so as to hear it. For everyone else, please take time to visit the trade show. The event will not be what it is without uh, the trade show. Our sponsors, who have contributed to making this event a success, would welcome the opportunity to connect with you. Simply click the, the tab on the left-hand menu of your screen, and exhibitors are searchable by name as well, or click on their booth on the 3D floor plan. Have some fun with that. You can interact via their public chat. You can request information. You can click on the Join Live button to request a video meeting. Don't forget, there are gamification codes throughout the convention platform in exhibitor booths on social media and even on the convention FAQ on ubcm.ca. Once again, thank you all so much. And thank you to the, to the panelists and for Minister Josie for coming in. Thank you all. Aichka.